and then for the Italian also on the FPMT YouTube, YouTube channel for Italy. Okay, I think Jitsuma might join us any second. So I wanted to welcome you back to Tushita. Wow, many people today. <laughs> yes, I think Jitsuma, I don't really have to um, introduce her in length. I think Venable, yeah, uh, Jitsuma, everybody, um, everybody knows her, yeah, from the cave in the snow. So maybe you have just joined our watch party. I hope you enjoyed. And apparently it will be still there on Facebook. So you can watch it also in different time zones. Yeah, people who are, uh, will listen to the recordings right afterwards, uh, join the watch party uh, afterwards and the recording will be still there. Maybe not the watch party, but the recording. So I was told, uh, otherwise let us know and we put it on again. Yeah, uh, so Jitsuma, I'm just looking out while I'm talking. I'm looking out if Jitsuma appears on my screen here with, uh, yeah, I hope on my screen and not somewhere somewhere else. So um, Jitsuma came um, to India in the 19, oh, <laughs> 1960s. Many of you were not born yet. Uh, so, and then got ordained quite quickly. Uh, she met her guru quite quickly, got ordained as one of the first Western nuns. So uh, then um, she stayed a few years uh, with her, looking at the names. Yes. Jitsuma, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, where are you? I can't see you on my screen. You must be one of the small ones here. <laughs> There's so many people. 150, the people go up, 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 and I can't see you. Where are you? Antonin, could you highlight Jitsuma? I can see me. <laughs> you can see yourself. <laughs> <laughs> does, that have, does that have a very deep meaning? <laughs> Some Madhyamika, something. <laughs> Shita Matra. <laughs> Welcome to Tushita Jutsuma. Thank you. <laughs> so, so very happy to welcome you. Uh, I'm not a Tushita, but, um, you know, in spirit I am. And we are so very honored and delighted to have you here with us. Um, not, not quite in person, but almost. And thanks to technology, we can enjoy you anywhere in the world. So we have students joining us from, I think from 60 countries, from India, of course. And we are, are so very, very honored to have you and uh, that you make time for us. And mm. could I just offer, please, please, please accept. I know you are not one for, you know, those ritual things, but I would love to. So, Venable Nandro in Brazil is ready. Sashi Puki Joji Meto Tram Rira Blinzi Nidi Gyanpa Di Sange Zingo Mikte Owayi Drukun Nam Dating La Chupa Shoki Ram Gurat Namana La Chamnyata Thank you so much. <laughs> I had to do that <laughs> since you never accept <laughs> before. <laughs> and Venable Nandrol is uh, joining us from Brazil. I think Jitsuma remembers her. So we have a translation into Portuguese. Also, Venable Sayana is joining us from Italy, from Instituto Lamazon Kappa. And uh, Paloma, La Venable Paloma, is uh, translating afterwards into Spanish. So we have quite a few centers joining us in this very special event. So will these translations be simultaneous or should I stop and let them translate? Simultaneous, uh, okay. everything is taken care of, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah. Instituto Lamazon Capa in Brazil, very efficient. They're used to those things, yes. So I introduced Jitsuma already a little bit. Uh, so I think we could just jump right in uh, because I think everybody knows Jitsuma. <laughs> and we also uh, showed the movie right on the watch party. 
I don't know, Jitsumala, if you know what that is, a watch party. I didn't know what it is, but it's something where people can enjoy a movie all over the world together on Facebook. Okay. Uh, so we showed The Cave in the Snow just before your movie. Yeah. So I think everybody will be very aware of what's going on. Yeah. So we could just jump in. Yep. Jump. Ich bin online. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, our neighbor just came in <laughs> and he, <laughs> he waved to me, so I, I said, I'm online. <laughs> um, so our first question, um, our first question is actually coming from Brazil, uh, Jutsimala, and um, it's Tamin, and Tamin is saying, um, thank you so much for your precious teachings, Venabajutsuma. For decades, you have been covering a long and arduous way with love and compassion on behalf of gender equality in Tibetan Buddhism. Nowadays, from your point of view, even though nuns can study and debate, what's the major progress to be highlighted in this journey? I would say the level of confidence and self-esteem uh, in nuns nowadays. When I first started, because nuns, women in general, have been traditionally very overlooked, neglected, and basically disregarded, uh, their level of confidence in themselves and their level of respect for each other and their level of just the, of, you know, basic self-esteem was very low. And in all nunneries, when we said, what is the main problem? It would always be lack of confidence. Now, because nuns are being taken seriously, they are studying the same program that the monks are studying. They are receiving the same uh, titles that the monks are receiving. And also they are doing practices which previously had not been allowable for women. Now they are practicing those. So I see very much, not only, I mean, my own nuns, not only their level of confidence has risen, but that the new ones coming in are already at a much higher level of um, well, well being within themselves. I mean, they, they don't know there's any ceiling. You know, they, they, for them, the sky's the limits now. They can do anything they want and they do it because they believe in themselves. They see other nuns can do it, so we can do it. And they don't know even that 20 years ago, 25 years ago, all of this would have been impossible for them. So the new ones are standing already on the shoulders of the senior nuns and um, are accomplishing so much and don't even realize that this is a huge breakthrough. In, and therefore the monks also respect the nuns very much. And the lay people now also are respecting the nuns so much and you know, requesting uh, rituals from them. When, when we go to our Tibetan colony, the lay people stand up as the nuns walk past. Uh, previously, they wouldn't even have noticed them, what the speaker stand <laughs> up. And, you know, and the monks likewise are very, very gracious to our nuns and um, really love having Dharma sisters. So that's enormous not only from the, their side, but from the side of society supporting them. It's been a huge breakthrough. So this is good for everybody. It's a win-win situation. Nobody's, it's not a cake which if the nuns get a bigger part, the monks get a lesser part. I mean, Dharma is not a cake. And so everybody's winning with this. And um, it's a very positive, a very, very positive step forward for female potential. They're showing they can do anything, you know? Whatever the boys can do, they can do it just as well, sometimes better. Yes. So also for lay women, I think that is a great, great progress. 
great example? Well, I mean, certainly um, in the West, uh, the majority of any audience in the Dharma circles would be female. Take away the women, and there's a Lama sitting up on his throne in a practically empty hall, you know? Who's going to make his tea? Um, you know, so the Lamas are realizing now. I mean, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama said to me, so I know he said it, and he said it to many, but he's, he also said it to me, that he said, in my opinion, the future of the Dharma is in the hands of the women. And Kamapa, when he came to visit our nunnery, said the same thing. He said to the nuns, you are the future of the Dharma. So um, I, the Lamas are recognizing it, you know, that really and truly educated women, they have, you know, more focus, devotion, intelligence. They have every, all the qualities, nothing against the boys. The boys have always had it. Now the girls likewise are stepping up. And so there's more of a balance as women find their own voice. So, you know, there's some also very interesting young nuns in the Tibetan tradition who have done all their studies, maybe six, nine years retreat, and they likewise very confident, very assured. And I think in the future that they will also really have a voice because what the women always lacked was a voice. Now things have changed. Impermanence has a good side, right? You know, changes can also be for the better. Ritsumala, yes, I wanted to thank you so much. I mean, you've been our trailblazer for, oh my goodness, so many years. I just told everybody, you know, that Jitsuma came to India in the 60s. You know, many of the audience, especially, you know, the Indian audience is very young. <laughs> so the 60s, they go like, 2060s, <laughs> no, 1960s, <laughs> and you know you were one of the first. You met your guru quite quickly, and were one of the first nuns to get ordained uh, in the in the Tibetan tradition. Mm. Yeah, and then uh, you stayed at your guru's monastery for a few years up in uh, Lahore, and then moved into the the cave, the famous cave, for 12 years. And then, <laughs> yeah, so the rest, many of us know, you went to Assisi in the middle for the Italian listeners here. Um, when I mentioned to Venerable Siliana, uh, you know, we have Chitsuma hosting her and she said, oh, yes, 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 she has been, you know, to Italy. <laughs> so uh, many of the younger listeners might not be aware. And then since then, for the last 20, almost 25 years, that's uh, building up your nunnery and now it's running and producing the first uh, teachers and people are on long-term retreat and it's, it's quite amazing. Yes, lots to rejoice in, wow. <laughs> What a, what a life accomplishment. So you have been our trailblazer and we thank you so much uh, because for the women, there are not yet that many yeah, models to look up to, let's say like this. So um, it's been very important to us, to all of us. So uh, Jitsumala, we have a few more questions, if I may ask. Uh, something very practical. So Sophie Valencia, she is asking, uh, probably especially during this time of lockdown uh, in many countries, you know, I think many people experience the same, you know, uh, situation, the same mental, you know, um, challenges. So she's asking, what is the antidote for fear and anxiety? Um, like the fear of sickness and the fear of death and may I add the fear of losing your job right now or the uncertainty, the uncertainty of the whole situation. Many countries are still in lockdown. I think in India it's now getting more normal, but here in Europe we're all still sitting in lockdowns and it's getting extended and extended. And I think so it is in many other countries in the world. Well, one thing about the Dharma, about Buddhism, is that it always faces the problems of life. It doesn't gloss over them. 
I mean, the Buddha said that our ex unenlightened existence in this world is by nature difficult. It's dukkha. It, it's unsatisfactory. So we shouldn't be surprised when things become difficult because the Buddha never said this is a joyride. You know, as long as we are in ignorance and, and grasping at, you know, this sense of me and mine, we're going to suffer. If it's not one thing, it's going to be another. But fear is a very interesting emotion. And even without this, you know, present pandemic, many people, especially also when they start to practice, one of the emotions that comes up, people imagine that we are going to have joy and bliss and clarity. Often the first thing which comes up is fear. Because as the mind quietens down, then these uh, un unwelcomed emotions, which we normally would suppress, are given, as it were, permission to rise up into the consciousness. And so therefore many people uh, report on, on great feeling, deep sense of anxiety and fear. So whether it's because of sickness, death, losing a job, something tangible, or just a, an unrelated feeling of anxiety, which is just there without any particular object, the important thing, I think, is not to fear fear. To, because that's just adding on to the problem. The thing with any strong emotion, fear, anger, lust, any feelings which come up very, very strongly, what we need to do is not to reject them or to fear them, but to welcome them. This is what our understanding of the mind is all about, that whatever emotion comes up, whether it's a good emotion like bliss and clarity or a negative to our mind, to the ego's mind, a negativity like anxiety, fear and anger, rather than trying to suppress it or get rid of it, we should embrace it. This is very important that we should welcome it and ask, what is your problem? Listen, what, where in the body are we feeling this emotion? Because sometimes you feel the whole, certain parts of the body start to tense up or the heart starts to beat, or do you feel something in the stomach? To look at that, to relax that, to, but especially the feeling to just look at it, but with, eyes of compassion and friendliness, not with rejection. And especially for things like fear of death and sickness to, to make friends, make friends with death. Death is poor death, nobody loves him. Everybody rejects him, everybody fears him. So make friends, you know, I mean, truly it's, it's so important. That, that we, we don't reject that which makes us feel uncomfortable, but that we open ourselves and embrace it and look, try to look into its nature. Because, you know, we say, oh, all these feelings are, are empty in their nature. And that sounds very good. But we need to really see what that means that this is not something solid, this is not something permanent, this is not inherent in our nature. This is a learned response which we have and we can therefore transform it. And we transform it by knowing it. And we know it by making friends with it. So this is the point. We give it loving kindness and compassion just as we would give loving kindness and compassion to any, anything which is suffering. So here, this is our self suffering. So give it love and compassion and the, the fear, the anxiety, look into its nature. What is it? Where is it? How does it feel? But with 
kindness, not with, with rejection. And the second thing about fear uh, of death and sickness is that it can act as a goad to make us more diligent. Right now, I'm not dead. Right now, maybe I'm not sick. So this is the time to practice so that when the time comes, which it will, that we become sick and then uh, reach the time of dying, we can do so with confidence because we made use of the time when that was not our problem. We're not dead, we're not sick, we're here. So make use of that while we're here. And then when it, the time comes, then we can face it with confidence, knowing we've done the best we can. The Tibetans have a saying, na 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 ji na ji, which means if you're sick, you're sick, and if you die, you die. And that's the point. When I was in the cave, I always said that to myself. If I got sick, I said, you know, well, if you're sick, you're sick, and if you die, you die. So either you get better or you don't, it's a big deal. Make friends, make friends with everything. And by being friendly, it transforms of itself. And our fear turns into confidence, truly, but not maybe right away, slowly, slowly, but whenever fear comes up, rather than trying to suppress it, reject it, turn our mind to something else, we look straight at it. And we ask, what's your problem? With friend, like being a psychologist, looking at the patient, what's your problem? Tell me about it. Listen. Because that also is a, a kind of wisdom there. If we don't reject, we shouldn't be afraid of fear. It can be a big help on the path. Anyway, there, there are, I'm sure, many, many um, books and talks on, on how to deal with fear intelligently and make use of it on the path. Everything we can make use of. Nothing should be rejected. That leads straight to the next question. Thank you so much, Itzumana. Um, also a question on emotions. What to do if you have lots of doubts and wrong views? Like one day you believe, and the next day you think maybe there is no afterlife or maybe there is no karma and it's only an unfair world. How to have faith in something you cannot prove? Well, my feeling is that, all right, whether we can prove there is um, future lives and the consciousness goes on or whether we cannot prove that, whether there is karma or whether there is not karma, Sorry, I'm getting you back again. I only see me, which is very disheartening. There you are. Um, the point is to, to act as if there were. Because if we act as if there really is the karmic effects of our actions of body, speech and mind, if we act as if there really is a continuity of consciousness and a next life, then when we die, if there is, then we will be very grateful that we were careful in this lifetime. And if there isn't, and we just go boom, then at least we have done something useful during this lifetime and we haven't wasted it. So it's a win-win situation. You know, act as if there is, and if there is, then we'll be grateful, and if there isn't, well, then who cares? But we have done something useful in the meantime with our lives, and we haven't caused any harm to others, which is mostly what karma is concerned with, not harming others, not harming ourselves, but living a life which is of benefit to ourselves and to others, so that at the time of death, whether there is consciousness continuing or not, we can die with no regrets because we have used this lifetime to bring benefit to ourselves and to bring benefit to others. It was a life well lived. 
So that's it. Isn't it? You know, act as if it is, and it's a win-win situation again. Yes. Um, the next question is uh, very practical again from Divya. How to deal with people who have a lot of expectations of me, and I know I cannot fulfill them completely, and my actions are not fulfilling my expectations. Um, I think Divya is afraid that she's hurting the other person deeply in that process of not fulfilling their expectations. Relax. You know, honestly and truthfully, we are never able to fulfill the expectations of others. And as the Buddha himself said, we are all the heirs to our own karma. We are all the owners of our own karma. So we cannot try to be something that other people expect of us. We have to be true to our own self. And, you know, provided one is nonetheless, you know, kind and, and considerate, one has to listen to one's own heart. What is one's own heart telling one to do and follow that? Because, you know, otherwise it doesn't work. You know, they are never going to be satisfied. You're never going, you feel that you've lost your, your, the path. And a lot of people, you know, um, for example, my, my very good friend Aileen, who you know very well, uh, Kunben knows very well, I mean, she, her mother was a very devout Catholic, and I mean, she's Irish. And so, um, you know, many of her uncles and aunts were Catholic nuns and monks, priests. And so when Aileen became Buddhist, and especially became a nun, her mother was so upset, so angry, that for several years she would not even speak to her. And if Aileen tried to call her, she would put the phone down. But then as time went on, she recognized that Aileen was going to do what Aileen felt was right for her. And her mother agreed to meet her again. And then by the time I went to meet her mother with a Scottish nun, Annie Kay, her mother was extremely welcoming. And because Kay has a great sense of humor and she's Scottish, I mean, we had great fun and lots of laughter. And her mother, in the end, invited in her neighbors to meet us because she was so proud of us and said, next time you must come and stay with me. And so next time also when we saw her, she was extremely welcoming and kind. And then she, she had recognized that Aileen was happy and that her friends were not as weird and, you know, some weird kind of cult that actually we were fairly normal, despite how we looked. And that, that for Aileen, this was the right way for her. So I think this is the point, that mostly people find that in time, those people accept you as you are and respect you for following the path which was meaningful for you even though it was not the path which they themselves would have chosen for you. So have patience, be kind, be patient, but do what you know, your inner calling is. That's the point. You, you have an inner calling there, then you have to follow that calling. And you know, just be friendly, just be humorous, relax, as I said, relax. You know, and just be who you are. Be true to yourself. Don't have to pretend to be somebody else just to please others. Be, be honest, be truthful, be natural. Right? Otherwise you're playing a part, which is not right. So I would say to her not to worry, be friendly, be kind, and eventually they'll come around. Yes, very good advice for many of us. It has been coming up um, many times the question of how to be authentic and 
to be oneself with so many expectations as a good daughter, as a wife, as a good colleague, as a or so many roles we're playing and so many expectations and that often we have to play a role in our workplace maybe otherwise people you know um, <laughs> to be ourselves and authentic it has brought up a lot of reactions when this question came up before and people were questioning what is it to be authentic and what is it to be oneself well, I mean, you know, at least you can you can be kind. You can be, you know, you can laugh. You can have a sense of humor about yourself. Not take yourself too seriously, and not take the situations too seriously. You know, because be, that's another kind of grasping. And you know, we're trying to open up and let go rather than when than hold on, because their reaction is also based on attachment, including an attachment to their own view. And, you know, that's exactly what we're trying to, you know, release, not plug into that energy. Yes, I think Jitsuma has mentioned before, as a seventh per perfection, we should have humor. So oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, if we can't laugh, where are we? You know, <laughs> we, we have to be able to laugh at the situation, at ourselves, a kind laugh, not a cynical laugh, a, a kind laugh, but don't take yourself so seriously. <laughs> you know, because really, really, the whole of Sangsara is a joke on one level, a cosmic joke. <laughs> As a German, I try to learn from the English. <laughs> <laughs> You're famous for your great black humor. <laughs> So there is another question um, from Anna Wu, and uh, she would like to study Buddhism at university. She's a lay person, not a nun, and she would like to study Buddhism at the university. And she wonders what subject Jitsuma would feel most important. And then she's also wondering where she can do long retreats. So I think it's the whole question about as a lay person, how can you practice Buddhism? in maybe the most effective or most important way? Well, as to what she would like to study in Buddhism in a university, I mean, I think that first of all, it depends on the university and the kind of teachers available. And of course, also what, what you're interested in. I mean, if you're interested in the philosophy, then you study the philosophy. If you're, for example, interested in women's studies, then you could study Buddhism from the point of view of women's studies. I mean, all the historical aspects of, the, of it. I mean, a lot depends on your interest and also, as I say, on the kind of teachers who are available and where you're learning it. Um, you know, because it, especially in universities, it becomes very academic. It's certainly not based on, on faith and devotion, which they regard as being very suspect. So sometimes uh, it's quite hard for genuine Buddhists to study in a, a university, to study Buddhism in such a, a cold and distant uh, way without any heart to it. It's all up in the head. But, you know, then there are the universities which actually have genuine Buddhist professors, you know, who are actually practitioners who are also teaching. So, I mean, it, a lot depends on where she's, she's got planning to study and what she wants to study in that. As to longer retreats, again, it depends which country you're in. Uh, longer retreats means what? One month, three months, three years? You know, what do you mean? Um, I, I would definitely say that to, to start with, one should start with short retreats and group retreats. You know, I mean, I think it's quite important in the beginning to get, have guided retreats because, you know, things come up during retreat. If you're by yourself in a solitary retreat, there's no one to ask. Um, so it's good to do uh, group retreats. That also gives a group energy, you know, which... Um, 
can be very sustaining and also a discipline because you can't just get up and you know, if you're a bit bored or your legs are ache, get up and go off and make yourself a cup of coffee. You have to sit there if you're in a group. So it teaches discipline. It teaches um, how to practice properly. You get guidance. If you have questions, you have someone who can help you understand what's going on inside and so forth. So I think that in the beginning, at least, it, it's important to do uh, shorter retreats. Long retreats in the sense of three years often are not very successful. I mean, I know so many people have had a lot of problems trying to do three year retreats because they are, there's a, it's a whole long question about it, but they, many of the three year retreats which are offered are geared towards the, the way things were in the Tibetan psychology pre-communist, you know, where everybody had, you know, in a country where there was no electricity, there was no radio, no television, no, no anything really. There were no newspapers, no magazines. Everybody, you know, either walked or rode on um, horses. There was no real traffic. People's minds were very empty and things were very slow. So when they did retreat, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, getting people motivated <laughs> to, you know, finish millions of mantras in a very short time, do millions of this, millions of that, everything was numbers, to get people activated from a society which was very, very slow. And also because people's minds were so empty, then they could fill it with all these very colorful visualizations as well as you know very complicated philosophical thinking because people had lots of room in there it was like an empty canvas to be filled with all these these you know colorful uh, deities and and ideas but for us most people's minds are already chock block full you know they're they're stuffed full it's not an empty canvas and we have a lot of stuff in there, mostly junk. I mean, a lot of our stuff that we get in coming, especially from the media, is just complete trash. And so to build a Buddha palace on top of a, a rubbish dump is not a good idea. And therefore it helps to do practices which allow us to empty out a bit, put some space in there, not cram it with more at this point. I think for many people, Vajrayana is just too complicated. What they need is to relax, to open the mind, to become more conscious, more aware, more bring more space into the mind, not cram it full with more. We need to empty out. And many of the longer retreats are very, very busy. Very, very busy. And they don't have much space in there. So I would be careful what kind of retreat you're planning to do. And I would say, start with shamatha, with good, clear teachings on shamatha, on how to make the mind more clear, more open, more aware, more present, to cultivate that. Because also, if we have awareness, we can bring that also merging with our daily life. There's no, you know, this is the session, then there's, you know, the, the uh, bit in between where the mind just goes crazy again, that allows the mind to become settled and clear throughout the day, a sense of presence, loving presence. It's very important. So to use our retreats for that, for learning how to cultivate our loving awareness and to relax and be at ease and have some more open spaciousness. This is what is really important. So that it infiltrates the whole of our life, not just when we're in retreat. It's no use being in retreat then when we come out and it all falls apart. We have to have something which continues. Yeah, sorry. Go. No, perfect. Thank you so much, it's some very precious advice. Uh, I've been hearing many, many times that uh, we're Westerners. We all have something what the Tibetans call lung, like oh. a wind, 
wind disorder and that we're just always hyper <laughs> for the Tibetans and that well, you can't relax. Because of this pressure, you know, and we're already pressured. So it doesn't help, you know, it, the, our whole energy system gets completely out of balance by pushing too hard. Also the idea of getting a result, you know, that well, what have we gained from that? You know, it's not a matter of what we gain, it's a matter of what we lose. I always say it, it's, 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 we've got to drop things, not build up more and more for the ego to play with. Yeah, so learning how to relax rather than pushing, 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 so we don't get long. I think it's very difficult for many. Like me, when I hear relax, I hear lazy. <laughs> Who wants to be lazy? <laughs> I know. Be I'm lazy. Be lazy. <laughs> that probably is the best thing you can do for yourself. <laughs> but there is no time to lose Jitsuma, as Shanti Deva said. No, 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 no. I mean, that's all right in a society which was so slow. But in a society which is so speedy, it doesn't work. And in the end, people crash. It's like driving the Ferrari. If you don't know how to drive, you're going to crash, you know. Better to have an ox cart, which just, this is the year of the ox, right? So in the ox goes very slowly, but steadily. And it just keeps going, you know, and it gets there. It, it, it accomplishes all its deeds. It plows the field. It pulls the cart. But it's not in a race, right? Slow and steady wins the race, we say. <laughs> and it doesn't crash, you know? It just keeps I going. Think, I think that ties also in with the whole question of self-compassion. I think especially for women, we often feel like we have to, especially when we hear about bodhicitta and having compassion for all sentient beings, uh, we often forget ourselves because we oh. think we need to give and give and often think it's selfish to think of ourselves. It's a very deeply rooted, <laughs> I think, especially for women, yeah. Look, the Buddha himself said, when we practice the four Brahma Viharas, the four immeasurables, loving kindness, compassion, joy, joy is there, you see, mudita and uh, impartiality, then we start with ourselves. This is not some new age thing. This is the Buddha. The Buddha said, you start by giving loving kindness, compassion and, and rejoicing in your goodness to yourself first. Then, then you give it out to others, those you love or feel indifferent towards or those who are difficult and then to all beings. But if we don't have, you know, we have to encourage ourselves. The Buddha was very, very wise. And so he said the first thing, even though we're, Buddhism is all about no ego, no ego, no ego, but the Buddha realized that who is walking the path towards the dissolution of the ego is the ego. So in order to be able to walk the path, we need to have a well-balanced, healthy sense of self. That is going to walk the path joyfully towards the realization of no self. Even Shantideva says that arrogance and pride, of course, is a, is a defilement, but self-confidence is essential. We have to believe. And in order to walk the path, therefore, we have to have a well-developed sense of confidence in our own abilities. So the Buddha said, first start with shamatha, because in order to do shamatha, our mind has to be well-balanced and healthy. Otherwise, we can't really go into deeper levels of samadhi. Then, at the same time, giving ourselves loving kindness and compassion and empathy with our, our goodness to encourage ourselves, to make us healthy. If we have an unhealthy sense of self, low self-esteem, 
which, as you know, the Dalai Lama didn't even know what low self-esteem was. Mm. What's that? He said, right? He'd never heard of it. And then when they tried to explain it, he said, oh, I think very rare, very rare. Right, so you're dealing with that kind of culture who doesn't even know what low self-esteem is. And then if you are very proud and arrogant, then you can beat yourself down if you're some big Kempo or Geshe. But for ordinary people who have already very little confidence, the Buddha said, start by making yourself believe in yourself. You have to have faith that you can do it. When I first met the 16th Karmapa, within five minutes, he said to me, your problem is you don't believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, who will believe in you? So he didn't say, that's very good you don't believe in yourself because there is no self. He said, you got to believe in yourself. <laughs> right? So we have to start where we are. People with low self-esteem are always thinking about themselves. It's not that they have no ego. They're always thinking about poor me and how useless I am and how I can't do anything. But it's all circling around themselves. That's why, you know, they go to psychotherapists to try to make them healthy, their sense of self. Because a healthy sense of self, only that can really walk the path. And this is what the Buddha understood. So he said, start with yourself. Get yourself strong, healthy, confident, and you'll walk the path. You can't be a bodhisattva if you don't believe in yourself. Or you're always beating yourself up. That's not being a bodhisattva. That's not even humility. That's just low self-esteem, which is not something which we're aspiring to. You end up depressed and, you know, unable to function properly or beating yourself up if you're not functioning properly. That's not, that's not what he's talking about at all. So we have to have a, a healthy sense. If we, uh, I sometimes say if we break our leg, the leg is injured, we're always thinking about our leg. We can't walk properly. And we're always thinking, oh, my poor leg, my poor leg. Somebody hits it, oh, oh, my leg, my leg, my leg. But when the leg heals, when the leg is healthy, then we can run, skip and jump. But we're not thinking about our leg. Who is sitting here thinking about their leg unless the leg is hurting? And it's the same with the ego. If our ego is healthy and strong and, and well balanced, we're not thinking about ourselves. It's easy to think about others. But as long as we are injured inside, hurting inside, we are thinking me, 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 even if we're thinking how useless we are. That's, so this is very important to understand that we need to have a very balanced sense of self in order to walk the path towards selflessness. How did that come up? Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. It's very, very important to understand that because Buddhism looks like it's always bashing the ego. But if you look at the Buddha's advice, you can see that he understood that first we have to have a good, strong sense of, of self in order to dismantle it. That's why you do shamatha before you do vipassana. Right? You have a nice, strong, clear, well-balanced sense of self. Then you can start taking it apart. But while it's fragile and pained, if you try taking it apart, it just hurts it more. And we could end up mentally unbalanced, which is not the, the goal at all. Mm. Anyway, go. Yes, I think that also brings up the question of how we translate the teachings, the Buddhist teachings, being universal, but how do we translate them into our into our culture, into our background. And I think often guilt comes up. You know, I've also heard the Tibetans don't have guilt. <laughs> they have just healthy regret. No, no yeah, yeah, they have yeah. remorse. But they don't, they're not always, I mean, like if you have a, a, a wound, 
then if you're endlessly scratching the wound, it just gets deeper and it never heals. So yeah, you recognize there's a wound, you clean it, you put on some balm, and then you allow it to heal. I mean, that's important. Being, you know, endlessly flagellating ourselves for wrongdoing doesn't, doesn't solve the problem. I mean, as you know, we, we first you feel regret, remorse, then the, the um, conviction of never doing that again, right? That we, we, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. I won't try very hard not to make that mistake again. And to try to do something to counteract that, you know, something good is much more healthy than just endlessly moiling over all our past mistakes or our downfalls. I mean, like a baby, it falls down, a little toddler, it falls down, pulls itself up again. You know, it doesn't ever think that, you know, because it's weak, it's going to spend the rest of its life falling down. You know, every time it pulls itself up and starts again. It doesn't just sit there feeling sorry for itself. <laughs> Poor me. <laughs> Poor me, I'm so useless. I know everybody else is a, is a great bodhisattva. Everybody else is in deep samadhi meditating. <laughs> only me, I only have the one that has, you know, monkey mind. <laughs> I think it's a very common perception, Jitsuma. Everybody is better, just me. <laughs> I'm yeah. the one who, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Jitsuma, do you think that something like psychotherapy or could help to to build first that healthy strong ego or would it go overboard uh, paying somebody just to listen to you <laughs> you're not talking about the same me 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 again i think it depends on the therapist and i think it depends on the degree of mental problems Because if people really do have mental problems, meditation might be just what they don't need. Because the, what comes up, they won't be able to deal with. I mean, I, I sometimes say that if you think of consciousness normally as like an ocean, then normally we are on the waves of the ocean. The waves go up, the waves go down, we're tossed up and down on the ocean. But through shamatha then the ocean waves begin to steady and we go deeper and deeper below the waves but in the ocean of our consciousness well we might meet with friendly dolphins and nice goldfish and all nice that's what people hope for but there are also sharks there there are also killer whales there's all sorts of stuff going on in the depths and you don't know what you're going to meet But some people meet endlessly with really very monsters of the deep. Are uh, their memories traumatic experiences, or maybe they're somewhat mentally unbalanced? In which case, meditation is not good for them at this point. They can't deal with it. Their 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 sense of self is not strong enough. And so those kind of people would benefit from a skillful psychotherapist who can help them to. Um, On, on a mundane level, yes, but nonetheless, some psychotherapists are really quite spiritual. And nowadays there are also many Buddhist psychotherapists. I mean, most, many, many uh, Buddhist teachers, meditation teachers are also uh, psychotherapists. That's their, their job. I mean, that they, they do uh, teaching meditation as a, you know, an avocation. So, I mean, those kind of people who understand more deeply about the, the nature of consciousness could be very helpful. I'm not saying not. And I also, I, I have a number of friends who take psychiatric medication because if they don't, they are very unbalanced. I mean, what can you do? And But gradually, as they begin to practice more and more slowly, they begin to reduce the medication and eventually can come off it often. But... I mean, we shouldn't repudiate that side of the Western understanding of the mind because we should not use meditation as a psychiatric tool. That's not what it's for. 
I mean, we are, we are not using it for psychiatry. So if we need psychiatry, we should go to a professional psychiatrist. Meditation is not for that. So yeah, some, I mean, not everybody needs a psychiatrist, but some people really would benefit a lot. If they have a lot of, you know, mental instability, it could be very, very helpful, at least for a time. And as you said, I mean, the, the whole point of psychotherapy is to make a healthy, well-balanced ego. And that's exactly what we need for walking the path to beyond, go beyond the ego. So, you know, no harm. I think, Jutsuma, many people fear when they're, you know, being nice Buddhists that they're trampled upon, that people use them as a doormat. I think it's a very common perception. You know, I'm just always nice. I say yes, yes to everybody, try to please everybody, and then people will take advantage of me. Um, so could Shitsuma elaborate on that, that kind of, I mean, if I see His Holiness the Dalai Lama, if I see his Jitsuma, I don't see a doormat, obviously, I see some, pretty amazing, strong, determined human beings who know what they want and have a goal and go for it. Exactly. I mean, patience is not a weakness. Patience is a strength. Being upset and angry every time things go wrong is a weakness. So, I mean, I think we could look at, say, Tara. So when we think of Tara, as we can see behind you and behind me, we have this nice lady who is white and, and holding a lotus and smiling sweetly. And, you know, that is our idea of, you know, a good, nice bodhisattva type being. But Tara has 21 forms. And some of them are very wrathful. She's not always peaceful and sweet and smiling. She can be very, very fierce. And she represents fearless compassion. She's a very strong lady. And where it is needed to be strong, she will manifest that appearance. Always it's compassion, but compassion doesn't mean that you're always sweet and smiling. You can be very outwardly, you know, strong and quite, even quite wrathful. I mean, the other example of that is uh, Avodhikiteshvara Chinrezig, who is the Bodhisattva of uh, compassion. And again, is white, smiling, holding a lotus, looking like everybody imagines compassion to look. But the other side of Avodhikiteshvara is Mahakala. Mahakala, who is the chief of all the protectors, it's black, really wrathful, terrifying. But he's also compassion. And, and this is the point. I mean, anger is a, definitely a defilement. But if sometimes we have to manifest a wrathful appearance, if it is genuinely based on skillful, understanding of the situation and, and genuine compassion for others, then that, that it doesn't mean that we become all a bunch of wimps. I've never seen any Lama who, who was weak in that way. They're very tough guys sometimes, if it's necessary. When it's necessary to be sweet and smiling, they're sweet and smiling. When it's necessary to make a stand, they make a stand. But it's always based on compassion and, and seeing the, the situation skillfully in what, what way to manifest at this particular point. So it doesn't mean we get trampled on because people who cheat us or trample on us, they are making bad karma. So our compassion is therefore to try to help them to go beyond that way of acting unskillfully, if we can. I mean, we're not doormats. No bodhisattva is a doormat. I've never seen any Lama who, I mean, they can laugh and they can just go along with situations when they're not serious. But when it comes to something which definitely you need to make 
a, a real stand about, then they they will you know manifest a whole different aspect, at least for that time. Yeah, I mean, I think of Tara. I mean, she had so many different as you know different colors, different different moods depending on the situation, what is most appropriate for that situation to help not only ourselves, but to help the other. Because if we allow people to, to act unskillfully, we are not helping them. I mean, one time I, I, my Lama come to Rinpoche, he was very powerful. He's big and big solid guy, very, very powerful. But very, very sweet. He had a very soft voice, always very, very sweet. We were all terrified of him, but he was always very, very sweet. And then one time I went to see him and this other Tuku, he said, oh, maybe don't go in. I was Rinpoche's secretary, so I would see Rinpoche to see what he wanted me to do. Oh, don't go in. Rinpoche is very, very angry. He was so angry just now, you know. Uh, so I knocked on the door and went in and Rinpoche was just sitting there looking sweet. And then he said, you know, sometimes people are so stupid and they, don't, they do everything which is really against their own best interests. So sometimes you have to appear wrathful in order to stop them from doing very unskillful actions. What can you do? And he kind of, oh, you know, so that's it, right? I mean, the guy was probably terrified because Rimcha was very powerful, you know, but Rimcha inside was just acting out of compassion and recognizing this was the way to deal with this man who otherwise would act unskillfully. So, yeah, I mean, you know, compassion can be quite rawful. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Don't be a doormat. <laughs> Come then. <laughs> Is this my private therapy session here? <laughs> Sharing it with the world. <laughs> So how to be skillful, Jitsuma? How to, how to know when to do what? Especially when one is with many people, uh, maybe, yes, maybe the family or maybe in one's working place or uh, how to be skillful. When do we know to say something and when rather to be silent or... As Shantideva says, you know, why worry if you can do something about it? Why worry if you can't do something about it? <laughs> you know, but how to make the distinction? I think this is where the practice of meditation comes in, because um, genuine meditation, especially, you know, um, meditation on developing awareness gives us a sense of presence. When we have a sense of open spacious presence we can see with so much more clarity not obscured by our own emotions but see other people very much more clearly then spontaneously we know how to manifest in in that situation this is one of the reasons why cultivating this sense of loving awareness is so important not just because it helps us but because it helps us to manifest in the world in a way which is skillful and without being caught up in on our, our own you know ego delusion we begin to see the the whole dynamics the whole mandala so much more clearly and then naturally we would know how to respond whether to allow it to happen or to make a stand or or you know how to just laugh it off or whatever is needed just naturally we begin to understand what to do and other people think, oh, how skillful, but actually, I mean, you see it with, with great beings, how they act. They just naturally know the, how to respond to the different people that they meet. And I don't think it's, it's a rational idea. It just comes from within, just naturally flows from their, their uh, basic presence. That's why, you know, like His Holiness, you know, you can see he knows how to respond to people. It doesn't think about it. I'm sure he's not planning it. It just naturally flows from his ability to be this embodiment of wisdom and compassion. But that's why awareness and, and mindfulness and, and the sense of 
innate presence is so important because it helps us for acting in the world. How to act skillfully without having to go through the head first. It just naturally flows. Until the ego gets in the way. <laughs> that goes off very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that brings up the whole question of balance between this comes up again and again, you know, shall I go up in a cave for oh, we are over time. It's so, so nice chatting with you, Jitsuma. <laughs> but we also know that <laughs> we don't want to, you know, take your time too much, Jitsuma. It's okay. I have an appointment to go walking at half past five, so we still have some time. Okay, <laughs> the balance between being by oneself, doing a retreat or just once morning practice or whatever it is, going for a walk or something and to be with others. I think that comes up very often that maybe again, feel, people feel guilty. Oh, you know, I can't take time for myself or I should be like this, I should be like that. So how to know where the balance is between taking time for oneself solitary going up to the cave for maybe not 12 years but <laughs> we ruled out the three years as well but going for a short retreat or being being out there in the world and trying to help with one's limited capacity i think it's really very important to breathe in and breathe out so we breathe in by giving time to ourselves for our practice. And then we take that and we breathe out for benefiting others. I mean, this is very important. It keeps the balance between the two. If we're only breathing in, 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 we asphyxiate. If we're only breathing out, 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 we collapse. A lot of people who are social workers or running Dharma centers and so forth, they burn out. And they burn out because they're always giving out, 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 and they don't take time to breathe in. And so it's very important to breathe in. And then when you breathe in, you get some understanding, some insight. We need to find out if that's genuine insight by then coming out and relating to others. So there's, there's this balance between the two. And I think this is very important, and especially in the modern world that we we need to, you know, I mean, it's like if, with the computer, my laptop here, um, you know, it's, if, if we keep going, it's going to go flat. So then it will all just, you know, collapse. And so I need to keep recharging it, right? If you recharge it, it will function. And, but you don't keep it on recharge the whole time. Once it's recharged, then you can use it. And so that's what we need to do. We need to keep recharging ourselves also. Every day, a little bit of um, practice in the early morning, even if only 10 minutes, 20 minutes, that helps to give us a recharge for the day and set our motivation for the day. And then as much as we can, when the opportunity comes to take at least a few days off, a few weeks, whatever we can afford. But we need then to take it out into the world and. Um, because also with others, we have opportunities to practice, to cultivate those qualities which we can't do in by ourselves, like patience, loving kindness, compassion. It's one thing to sit on your cushion thinking, may all beings be well and happy. It's another thing to go out there and try to help them to be. So uh, the two go together. And I think that it's not an either or, it's a both and. Yes, because there has been a question right now in a chat of a person saying she wants to go in, in the cave <laughs> and be there's by nothing, herself. You know, I always say be there's peace. a monkey's living caves. I mean, you know, there's nothing magical about caves. I think it's a dream of peace. There, I'm by myself, I'm peaceful. <laughs> But, you know, caves are damp, caves are cold, caves have all sorts of problems too. It's an, uh, just stay in your room is enough, you know. 
Das steht so. <lacht> I speak from experience. <lacht> oh, there is one lady. May I ask the question? Because I'm, I'm curious as well. Is it too late to ask Shitsuma what she thinks the meaning of her being born in Bethno Green was? My mother. Beth Bethno Green is uh, the East, area? East London. East London. The reason mm -hmm. I got reborn there was my mother. I am completely sure of that. There was no other reason. And I always felt I was in the wrong place and that I had to leave England, which is what I did when I was 20. But why was I born there? Because my mother, that's the only reason. She was an extraordinary, and my upbringing as a spiritualist. So we were always talking to spirits and that also helped me to understand that there was so much more going on than we imagine is going on and that definitely there is consciousness after death. So um, I'm very grateful for that. And my mother was a wonderful example of, of a, um, a bodhisattva who didn't even know what word bodhisattva meant. But her skill in means uh, in times when, uh, you know, of real problems and difficulties and with myself also being very sick when I was young, um, she was just so unbelievably skillful. And she really was a wonderful woman. And I, I mean, I think that she, she, she there can only be because of her. The rest of my family were useless. I mean, nice people, but totally pointless as far as, you know, my journey was concerned. But my mother was a very important person in my life. And later she came to India. She took refuge with my Lama. She took precepts. And um, the Lamas loved her. They liked her much more than me, I think. They really <laughs> liked her a lot. And um, she, yeah, so that's why I was born in Bethel Green. It didn't matter where the place was. It was uh, the person, the, my mother, that was important. My father died when I was two, so I don't remember him at all. So that's the answer to that. I liked Bethel Green, actually. It was, uh, it had its own character. Do you ever miss it? Not in the least bit. <laughs> um, no, and not at all. And as I say, when I was young, I, I always knew I, I had to leave, I, that I didn't belong there. But, and in fact, when I was very young, I, I was also puzzled about being female. I, I felt my body was all wrong. And I was told when you get older, your body changes. So I thought, well, maybe then I change into a boy. But by the time my body changed, I didn't want to be a boy, so that was all right. Um, but uh, I think also to be a, a female in this lifetime was a, an important thing. I'm very glad of that too. Uh, I think that uh, I don't want to go back into a man. Nothing against the males, but I don't want a male body again. I think a female body for, as Guru Rinpoche said, you know, that as to male and female, there is really intrinsically no difference. But if a woman has bodhicitta, then a female body is superior. Why? Because, first of all, because women are naturally, you know, nature intended us to be mothers and to be nurturing. So therefore, Loving kindness and compassion come naturally to us. We are not afraid of them. You know, we naturally uh, have, most women, uh, I mean, some men too, but in general, men are taught as boys to suppress their emotions, not feel that's not manly, etc. Women are not taught that. They can cuddle puppies and kittens and nobody tells them, you know, that there's not anything wrong with that. And so they're naturally also much more in tune with their emotions. And as, for example, um, Said, uh, Upandita Sayadaw, who's a very austere but famous Burmese meditation master, uh, when I met him, he said to me, and I never brought any of this up, but he said to me, 
that his best students, his best meditation students were the women. And he said, because women are more in tune with the intuitive and they can fly in space, like the translation of Dakini in Tibetan means someone who travels in space, Kandro. Uh, he said they, they can, they will, they can like jump into the, uh, into the, into the intuitive. They're not afraid of it. Most men like to go step by step by step. As you see, when they do meditation, they always put in, the scholars put it all into steps. Women just jump. They feel in tune with the intuitive. And so therefore they are better meditators. And my own Lama said that women, although they are usually more emotional, if they are in control of their emotions, then they naturally go up further and quicker than the males will do. Plus, the women, if you take the, in Vajrayana, if you take in Vajrayana, women in Tumo, you know, the inner heat meditation, think about it. Should I go into this? Why is a woman's body superior? In the inner heat meditation, as within Kundalini meditations, the energy, the sexual energy has to be brought from below up through the central channel. Now for the men, the main problem is that their sexual energies naturally go outwards, right? Their sexual organs are on the outside and their, their sexual energy is sent out. So they have to spend a lot of time taking that energy and bringing it inside to bring it up. That's a lot of their, their energy and time is taken in reversing their sexual energies. Women are already inside and they are already going upwards naturally. So for them, there's no problem. They can, they, the tumor is much easier for a woman than for a male. Plus when men, you think if any of you have ever done tumor, that the male, is visualizing himself as a naked female. He is seeing himself as Vajra Yogini, right? Women are already Vajra Yogini. We don't have to pretend. So also from that point of view, from the tantric point of view, also when you see tantric images, like Chakra Samvara, Guru Samaja, Hevajra, they are always shown with their consorts. They don't stand alone. But the consort, like Vajra Yogini or Naratmiya, they can stand alone, right? Vajra Yogini stands by herself. She has her, her consort as her staff. If she wants him, she brings him up, but she doesn't need to stand there like a staff. She doesn't need him, but he needs her as in, in, in Hindu tantras with the Shiva Shakti. The Shakti stands on top of Shiva. So yes, although, you know, all the books were written by the boys, so they don't mention this. But in fact, if you look at it, a female body is, is very uh, useful. So we should not regret that. I mean, the, the only problem with being a female was that we did not have the opportunities that the males had. Now that's not true anymore. Everything is being taught to females the same as to males. And so therefore we have a great advantage. We're, we're ahead of the game. So please all pray to come back as females next time, even the boys. I think we made a really nice circle there from the first opening to now um, Jutsuma teaching us first being the trailblazer and now teaching us how to fly, having taught us already in the last, oh my goodness, 60 years tirelessly again and again and again, because we need to hear it again and again and again uh, to be, yeah, to be brave, isn't it? Well, you know, we really have to remember that we really are all Tara. And that therefore Tara does represent fearless compassion. 
She's fearless. And that's our true nature. Compassion, genuine compassion is fearless. And that's what we have to invoke within ourselves. You know, that, that, that sense of, of our inner divinity. We are Tara. We just don't know that. That's our tragedy. That's why the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have compassion on us. Because we think we're just ordinary, flawed, sentient beings. And we don't realize that the, our Buddha potential is already there. We don't have to invoke it. Somebody doesn't have to give it to us. We already have it. What we don't have is a recognition of what we have. That's the point. Once we recognize it, then we know that's, that's our true nature. This is our false nature. And that's what, what the whole point of meditation is about, is coming back to realizing who we really are, not who we think we are. And who we think we are is, is our tragedy. We don't see. That's why the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have compassion for us, because we have such potential, and yet we, we don't know it. Like the story of the man, the beggar, who has this treasure under the ground, and he goes out every day begging for a few coins and thinking he's rich if somebody gives him a rupee or two. And all the time he has this huge treasure under the ground in his hut. He's a, he's a multimillionaire, but he doesn't know it. He's a crow party, but he doesn't know. He thinks he's poor. That's our tragedy. So this is why Tara is important to remind us when we look at her, we're looking in the mirror. May you all be well and happy and keep practicing with joy. It's very, very important to have joy in practice. You know, if we enjoy something, then it's easy for us. So we should not push too hard but we should, you know, have a nice steady pace so that we can, you know, as I say, like the ox cart, maybe we're not in a Ferrari, we're in an ox cart. The ox cart keeps going, you know, very steady. So this year the iron ox is very good. An ox represents strength, patience, you know, they're steady, they keep, they, they accomplish the task. They're not, you know, exciting like a tiger or a dragon. But it's very, very stable, very, very secure. And, you know, all the tasks they set themselves, they do accomplish. And that's what we need to do. Slowly but surely, just keep going and don't stop. Isn't that wonderful that we have the Dharma? We should be deeply grateful, no matter what we face. You know, if we have Dharma in our heart, it's, it's okay. Everything will be all right. So it's good. Be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Itsuma. This was a very delightful, at least for me, delightful. And I think for all... Let me see how many people joined us. 232 right now for all the students around the world. Um, yes, and many more will by re recordings uh, listening to you because they're in different time zones. Can't make it perfect for everybody. So the Americans, they're, you know, they're going like, what about us? <laughs> you know, they're still asleep, but uh, they will listen later. Thank you so much, Itsuma. It's so kind. Thanks. And lovely to see you, hear you, be with you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Gracias. Hope to see you very soon in person, Jitsuma. Please oh, stay well. healthy. No, <laughs> we can't say about that one. <laughs> You're always happy, but please stay healthy and please, please, please give us many, many, many more teachings, hopefully soon in person. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Jetsonma.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Well, Have a nice night. day. Have a nice night, wherever you Andrew are. And see, you. Be safe. see you again tomorrow for uh, a very, Bye -bye. very amazing human being. Our uh, only Western Geshima. Yes, please don't miss her. She's amazing. Yes. <laughs> see thank you tomorrow. Thank, thank you, you Thank you, Venable Sayana. Thank you to Brazil. Thank you, Paloma. Bye. Thank you, Nandro. Venable Nandro. Ciao, Virginia. Ciao, Chris. On behalf of Brazil, thank you so much, Chosela. Mm-hmm. <laughs>